Good evening. Welcome to uh, the fifth annual Voices from the Vanguard lecture series. This is the 17th time that we have welcomed an internationally known global disease expert here to the chapel at UGA. Uh, this series is a, an interdisciplinary joint venture of Dan Colley, who is seated down here in the audience, who is the head of the Center for Emerging Global Diseases, it's Tropical and Emerging Global Diseases. Try to say that fast a few times. And my name is Pat Thomas, and I teach health and medical journalism at the Grady College. Um, we we want to remind you that following the lecture, there's a reception next door at uh, Demosthenian Hall. Uh, so please do come over. We'll have refreshments and a chance for you to talk to our speaker. And if anyone is here uh, for a blue card and hasn't picked it up, the nice lady with the blue cards is uh, in the back. Um, you know, before I even met uh, Dr. Foster, I think that I, uh, I got off on the wrong foot with him because I referred to him as a researcher. And he said, I'm not a researcher. The woods are full of those. I'm a, well, he didn't exactly say it that way. He said, I am a public health practitioner, and that is indeed uh, what he is. He is uh, a person who had a personal hand in the eradication of smallpox, the only infectious disease ever vanquished from humankind by the smart deployment of vaccines. He's worked toward the eradication of polio. He's worked on more diseases than I can recite. He's worked in 50 different countries. You can read some of his biographical information inside the program, but I'll tell you two things that don't appear there. Number one, I understand that he has a great talent for destroying uh, bamboo bridges. Uh, he says he's broken a lot of them. And the other thing is that in pursuit of uh, the world's last uh, smallpox case, he lived with nomads in Somalia and survived for two months on uh, camel's milk and sorghum. Uh, which doesn't sound great to me, but, uh, you know, it, it worked for him at the time. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Stanley Foster. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Over the last two weeks, we have experienced from afar the aftermath of the effect of a severe earthquake on the poor population in Haiti. I also read in the press with admiration the stories of you, many of you from Athens who on Martin Luther King's birthday worked with the communities. Together those sentences sort of capture the themes of this presentation, poverty and empowerment. I have titled the talk, Inequality, Social Justice, and Empowerment. When we talk about inequity, we're all familiar with the inequity that occurs between the developed world and the developing world, or the high resource world and the low resource world. However, we don't often think about the inequities that exist uh, in our countries. And this is a wonderful data set from uh, Louisville, Kentucky, where they looked at median incomes in four districts, and they looked at the median age of death and infant death rates. And you can see in the poor communities, the rate of infant deaths was nearly 10 times that of the wealthy communities, and that the people living in the high wealth communities districts had 10, mere, 10 years more of life than those in the poor districts. So poverty is a major contributor to mortality. If we look at the underlying causes of death in the United States, 17% of deaths are due to poverty. Why is poverty the number one cause of death, or one of the two number causes of death with tobacco in the richest nation on earth? Poverty suppresses the immune system. If we look at 
Clark County, Northeast Georgia Health District, and Africa and World, you get some understanding of the inequity that exists between living in a full economy and living in a low resource economy. This is a picture of under five deaths, children under five per year. And you can see that each one of those dots represents 5,000 deaths. And we see the concentration of deaths in the Indian subcontinent, uh, in part due to the high population density, and also in Nigeria, where the mortality rate is very high. At this time, in 2000, 10 million children died before their fifth birthday. So when you have a problem like that, you start asking questions. Why the increased mortality? The first thing to look at is income. And you can see the rate of under five deaths in low income countries is much higher than in these ways. As a matter of fact, between low income and lower middle, uh, it's three threefold increase from poverty. Think for a moment, where were you born? We often sort of say, well, they've, they just aren't taking care of themselves. But think of where were you born. Were you born in a, in a country where sun and rain uh, were there? Be, or were you born in an area with monsoons, drought, malaria? Were you born in a country at peace or a country at war? Was your governance, was it responsive or indifferent? Was education available or not available? And think about who was your mother? Was she married? Was she single? Or was she raped? What was the income of the family, adequate or poor? Was she educated or not educated? What was the interval between births? And did she have access to obstetrical care or not? This is a graph showing the effect of education on mortality. And you can see the rate this is presented as a relative risk for zero education. And the more education that goes, the uh, lower is the mortality. I apologize to you men, the data on father's education makes no difference. <laughs> the, also, there is a major effect of birth interval. If the birth interval before and after birth is long, the mortality is lowest. If the before and after birth is short, mortality is much higher. For example, if a woman gets pregnant when she has a child that's four or five months old, she stops breastfeeding, and that child is exposed to infectious disease and nutrition risk. And secondly, if she has a baby quickly after previous birth, she hasn't recovered, she's undernourished, and the next born is at risk of infection and disease. Where do you live? These are four African houses. This determines risks, whether you have adequate water, whether that water is safe or contaminated, whether you have electricity. Why do the children die? And this is a little bit complicated graph, so let me go through it. Uh, most child deaths occur from these five causes. <coughs> Neonatal deaths, that's de deaths occurring around birth or in the first months of life, diarrhea, pneumonia, and malaria. But in the green here is the percentage, uh, or is the deaths that are due to undernutrition. So poverty, undernutrition are major contributors to mortality. Here you can see children. Look at their rib cages. You can see the bones. Undernutrition is a major contributor to the mortality of children. Not only does undernutrition contribute to mortality, but it, it contributes to slow learning, lack of uh, learning abilities. 
and has long-term costs. A colleague of mine has done a study which looked at nutrition supplement of protein versus vitamins that occurred 25 years ago. He looked at their current incomes and those who had gotten the protein had higher incomes 30 years later than when the study was done when they were children. Access to health care by walking distance. You can see here, this is hours of walking. So zero hours or greater than seven hours walking to the health center. And you can see that at the end, uh, t only 20 to 30 percent of the people living more than three hours from a health center attended a health center or a health facility in the last six months. What do you do in these situations? In many places, they do nothing. The people rely on traditional medicines and traditional doctors. They have no access to scientific medicine. The only solution is to identify people in the communities who, and teach them how to diagnose and treat diseases. For example, in pneumonia, if you teach a health worker to count respirations, they can diagnose pneumonia as accurately as a physician with a stethoscope. The quality of medical care is also important. I use this as quality, as an example of bad quality and good quality. On the left, you see the refrigerator full of fruit and water and often a beer. And if your vaccine is kept in that refrigerator, it is likely to be warmed and impotent. Whenever I saw, see a refrigerator like this, I go around the room and ask them, is this your beer or is this your beer? And they all deny it. So I said, well, if it's not yours, it must be mine. So I take off the cap and have a cool drink. <laughs> but if you look at the refrigerator on the right, about 80 or 90% of the refrigerators I've looked at in the last year have been like that. The first thing was to put a thermometer in every refrigerator in the world. The second was to make somebody responsible for recording the temperature on a chart on the front of the refrigerator. And fourthly was to have somebody come and check to be sure that the temperature on the chart represented that on the thermometer, because often we found that they would read the temperature and put on what it should be rather than what it actually was. So ensuring quality ensuring the potency of drugs and vaccines is equally important to access, in other words, attaining quality. If we look back over the 20, last 20 or 30 years, we've really uh, globally made some progress. We spoke briefly about smallpox. In the 1965, uh, when the program started, there were 15 million cases and 2 million deaths a year. The last case occurred in 1978. Iodine deficiency, in 1990, it was estimated that a billion IQ points were being lost per year due to the lack of iodine. Now, 75% reduction in iodine deficiency. In 1988, there were 350,000 polio cases a year. In, uh, oops, sorry, that's in, in 2009, there was only 1,579. And uh, the, the numbers from this year look good and four million cases uh, were treated for AIDS in 2009 with antiretroviral drugs. So progress is being made. However, if we look at our world, we have to be realistic. 1.4 billion of the nearly 7 billion people live below the poverty line of $2 a day. One billion are unnourished from calories, proteins, micronutrients like vitamin A or iodine. And as I said earlier, the lack of food stunts growth, slows thinking, saps energy, hinders fetal development, and contributes to mental retardation. Why the poverty? There is a, hem <clears throat> Excuse me. There is a hemorrhage of capital from Africa to the developing world. Low prices for natural resources, so-called aid, high prices for imports, high interest on external debts, 
and billions in capital drain. If we look at the flow of income from the wealthy countries and the developing countries, that there is a net transfer of money. The, uh, the red bars are the, for the whole world, the uh, transfer of funds from poor countries to rich countries. We talk about the money we spend in aid, not very much. But if we look at what our aid does, for example, in Mali, the cotton subsidies in the United States make the cotton grown by the Malian peasant unsaleable because of cost. And the, the money that we give in aid in no way substitutes for what they lose from their products. We look at the distribution of income in the world, and you can see that 82% of income is in the top quintile of earning. Why? One of my mentors made this statement. It seems clear that the minority in the world with power and money will not voluntarily use it to change significantly the plight of the poor. The, probably the ones, the two exceptions to this are Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. This looks at the per capita income between 1991 and 2002 and the amount of aid per capita. And you can see in 1960, it was $61 per capita. And in, 19, in 2002, it was $67 per capita. Over the last five years, it has significantly increased, largely due to uh, increases from Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation. The most important determinant of health is social justice. Three quotes. Survival of the African child is not a medical issue. It is a moral and ethical issue. Or from Jonathan Mann, a human rights framework describes the essential preconditions for health better than any other medical or public health model. If human rights are promoted and protected and human dignity is respected, you will have a healthy society in which people can best achieve physical, mental, social, and spiritual well-being. Go back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and it's something that you students should read through uh, at least once a year, and I picked out four of these. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Everyone has a right to education. Marriage shall be entered into only with the free and full consent of the intending spouses. Everyone without any discrimination has the right to equal pay for equal work. Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself, of his family. I just comment a little bit, in many parts of the world, the woman has no choice in marriage. In many countries, they're abducted. Where do we turn to? How many of you have heard of Paulo Freire? Raise your hand. A few of you had. His books are very difficult to read. Uh, Paulo Freire was born in 1921. Uh, during the Depression in the 30s, his family had a rough time. He lost four years of school, and he spent most of those four years playing football or soccer with the poor. And finally, he gained uh, he was educated in law, philosophy, and phenomenology. And while playing soccer with the poor, he noticed four things. That poverty, especially during the Depression, depression was widespread. The poor were apathetic. And he realized that apathy was not natural. Apathy only occurs when human needs are blocked by oppression. 
He was appointed director of culture and education, and when he started looking at that, he noticed that non-literates could not vote. And so literacy was his development priority. So Ferreri started listening, and he would look for words that were common in everyday conversation. He'd go to bars and brothels and see what words evoked emotion on the faces of speakers. And then he would use those words in his literacy training. And he was able to teach 300 sugar workers to read in 45 days. Out of this came a method of training for transformation developed by two Catholic sisters, Hop and Timmel, in South Africa. And they put up two paradigms, and I'll just go through these one by one. Much of development is by the experts coming in and telling the people what to do. You give to, you do for, you tell, you create dependence, and you really don't change. Alternatively, you listen, you facilitate thinking, speaking, and acting. You mobilize individual and community resources. And you get empowerment and change and health, well-being for all. This goes back to a conference that was held in Alma Ata in 1978. The people have the right and duty to participate individually and collectively in the planning and implementation of their health care. Good theory, but development and WHO continue to tell the people what to do. I would like to give you three examples, or share with you three examples. One is a story about Carol Berhorst. He went to Guatemala as a missionary and he started, he bought a farm, started growing corn. And after he got to know his neighbors, he asked them what their priority was. He told, they told him, a soccer field. So they built a soccer field. The next year he figured, oh, they'd come up with a health problem. And he met with his neighbors and they sat down again. What's your priority? Lights for the soccer field. The third year, they said, we got a problem with diarrhea. I'm a doctor. Well, this story tells you that the people gain confidence that they could identify a problem and solve it. When the Civil War came along and all expatriates were kicked out of the country, that program continued. Many of their health workers were killed as, quote, communists, but they had the confidence to keep going, uh, do this. And in his writings, Bearhorse reflects, and I'd like to read this to you, Genuine development requires creative participatory processes that encourage self-reliance and a balanced sharing of available resources. Again, the fundamental goal is empowering the poor. Our next Paula Freire is a friend of mine named Chepe Romero. Chepe had no school in his village he finally, somebody in the village taught him to read. He finally got to high school in his late 20s. He had training in forestry. forestry. And he, I asked him once, I said, what were your teachers like? He said, I had three, three teachers, one from America, one from Mexico, and one from Costa Rica. But only one was any good. And that was the guy from Mexico. He gave me an instrument. He didn't tell me what it was for, and he told me to go out and use it and come back and tell him what it was and what it was for. And the man had given him a sextant, and he figured it out. Chepe is one of the unique people I've ever met. He would sit down with communities, and he would listen to them, and he would talk with them, and he would know when they were ready. Sometimes one year, sometimes three years, sometimes five years, in some cases seven years. Once it occurred, he formed communities. He provided them the technical guidelines. He helped mobilize funds for materials. He even developed the Chipino stove, which is pictured here on the right. Oops. 
Um, and the Chapina stove was a miracle. You get a fire, which is usually on the floor. It, it gives smoke in the house, and it burned. It's often babies fall into the fire and get burned. And you get the stove off the floor. The women have less back problems, and uh, they kick, cook their tortillas on top of the stove. And many of my friends uh, run their water lines through their stoves so they have hot running water. Chepe, over his lifetime, developed 30 community water supplies. I want to tell you the story about one of those water supplies. It was in Las Barrancas. Chepe was working at the mom center where he had gotten some of his education. A call came from the Cazaltenango Hospital. They wanted a car to carry a dead body back to Las Barrancas, which was on a finca where the Indian workers were treated like slaves. As he got to the hospital, he said, you Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. They don't need the Bible, they need water. Well, Chepe, Chepe took the um, child back most of the way. The mother had to carry it the last distance. Um, but Chepe, and at that time, the Finker owners wouldn't let outsiders onto the Finker because they'd know they'd just, they see the slavery that occurred. But fortunately, Chepe had an aunt who lived on the Finker and actually was a cook for the Finker woman. So he went down there and he started meeting with the communities. And it was clear that water was their biggest need. So Chepe helped raise funds. He formed a water committee. And uh, they bought a spring five kilometers away. Uh, and they laid the pipe from that to the water and they now have three um, big water tanks. And it's interesting, if you go from a larger pipe to a smaller pipe, you can get water to go to a higher level. The next is Rosario. Rosario is a nurse, a midwife, a social worker, an accountant. If we look at the maternal mortality in the United States, it's risen recently, and that is distressing from 10 to 13. Among the Guatemalan Spanish, the maternal mortality is 70. Among the Indians, it was 211. She trained 30 community midwives. She would train them for about a year, and they went back to their communities. But there were real problems uh, in terms of when they had an emergency, somebody that they couldn't handle, how did they get them to the hospital? and commercial vehicles would not take a pregnant woman because they were afraid that it would die in the, tra in the tra transport. Anyway, uh, slowly they all got cell phones. In a few years, Rosario asked us to help raise some money for an ambulance, so we bought a um, four-wheel drive vehicle, and now they have that down there. We recent, my wife was recently talking to uh, Rosario and said, how was the uh, ambulance used last week? Well, she said it was used two times, three times. One was a woman who had a stillbirth. Second was a woman who had some bleeding. And third, it was sent for, to take one of our nurses out to treat a sick cow, because uh, we'll get to the sick cows in a minute. This is one lady in Las Barrancas, uh, Juvita. About eight years ago, we, we taught a course on community planning, and we taught to, to uh, draw maps of the community. The next time I saw Jovita was five years later, and she was working uh, in the area of the water project, and she had a map of her community where everybody who was pregnant or underweight or was in trouble was specially colored. Rosario worked with women to establish their own self-help groups. She has established 12 groups, and uh, uh, more groups are in the waiting. This is an area of, at about 8,000 feet, and her goal in setting up these groups was to address the spiritual development and health needs of poor people. What the process of the small groups was, was to really tip the balance. 
lack of education, undernutrition, disease, males in the U.S., non-functional families, and what was needed was self-esteem, self hope, faith, education, ability to earn community support. With the help of the Church of Canada and some churches here in Georgia, uh, money was mobilized so that small loans. It is interesting to look at the picture here on the bottom left. These are women signing for their loans. There are only four signatures on this page. All of the rest are fingerprints. This is their account statement kept by a woman with a third grade education. Uh, they have, she has a total capital for which she is responsible for of $70,000. Every time I look at her books, they look fine to me. What are they doing with these small loans? Hand weaving is a favorite. Animal husbandry. Agriculture. Sewing. And the women have gotten together and established a school for adults who didn't finish their education. At the request of the women, my wife and I go once a year or once every two years for, to provide training. We don't decide what we're going to train. They email us a couple of weeks beforehand and said, this is what you're training this year. Sometimes it's very easy. It's something we're familiar with. Other times it takes a lot of homework. This was the training that we did last year. We put up this picture of the parrot in the cage with the door open. And we asked them, what did they see? And they said, we are locked in our houses. And so we asked the question, why? They went into to small groups, and why are we locked in our houses? And they came up with a list similar to the one you saw previously, poverty, lack of education, cost of education, urban teachers not showing up at rural schools. They, uh, uh, they feel that it's really, uh, education is so important, alcoholism and spousal violence, husbands in the U.S., and the rising cost of food. And then we asked, how do you get out of your house if you're locked in there. Education was one. Meeting together as sisters was a second. Identify and solve our problems together, income generation, and two quotes. One woman got up and said, I am a widow. Without my project, I would be a beggar. And another woman got up and said, my pigs sent my four children to high school. One of them described a community problem that they had, that the urban teachers wouldn't come to their school on uh, rainy days. And so they discussed the problem in a group. They identified one woman to keep attendance. Then they had a meeting with the teacher and said if she didn't show up, they'd get her fired. The problem was solved. I'll close with this saying, which is 3,000 years old, but it is as true today as it was when it was written. Go to the people, live among them, learn from them, begin with what they have, build on what they know, and of the best of leaders, when the task is done, the people will say, we have done it ourselves. And we close with a picture from Guatemala. Thank you very much.